The Frankfurt School has something of a reputation. Many of the scholars who worked for what was, and still is, officially called the Institute for Social Research, such as Max Horkheimer, Theodore Adorno, and Herbert Marcuse, have had a huge influence on the study of society and culture, and secured their places on undergraduate reading lists across numerous subjects. It's necessary to note at the top of this video, however, that some of the Frankfurt School's notoriety outside of academia, in the contemporary moment at least, is due to the vitriol that has been levelled at them by their detractors. Figures on the political right, from Ben Shapiro to Jordan Peterson to the Times journalist Melanie Phillips, regularly invoke the Frankfurt School as a kind of intellectual group of supervillains, hell-bent on undermining Western culture. In today's video, my goal is to shed a bit of light on what the Frankfurt School was and is. I'm not going to be directly tackling any of the conspiracy theory stuff, yet it's worthwhile saying that, unlike when one usually unpicks a fanciful tale, which usually concludes with finding a somewhat boring reality underneath, the real story of the Frankfurt School is quite remarkable. It begins with a failed revolution, moves through a global conflict, involves exile, collaboration with the CIA, and meetings with the Pope. And it is very much the story of the Frankfurt School which I'll be focusing on today. While we'll touch on a number of different aspects of the school's work, and get a sense of how their interests changed over time, my hope is that this overview might serve as an introduction to some more in-depth videos on individual scholars and texts. Of course, if that's something you would like to see me cover, then do let me know down in the comments below. And if you'd like to see those future videos, then uh, subscribing and hitting that notification bell will mean you'll get a little buzz when they're released. Finally, if you like what I do here and would like to support me to make more videos like this, then I would be super grateful if you would check out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Tom Nicholas. With that out of the way, however, let's crack on with the Frankfurt School, What the Theory. <laughs> Before we come on to discussing the Frankfurt School itself, it's worth grounding ourselves in a little bit of historical context. Our scene then is Germany. And by October 1918, it was evident that, for Germany, the First World War was going to end in defeat. Having already suffered through four hard years of conflict, the German people now not only had to contend with the demoralising feeling of having lost the war, but also with the likelihood of financial hardship in order to pay reparations to the countries they had been defeated by. These economic concerns, along with a broader social tension between the nobility, who had led the war effort, and the working class, who had done the actual fighting, meant that things were tense. Now, if you were a Marxist intellectual at the time, and one thing the Frankfurt School's detractors do get right is that they were, initially at least, Marxists, you would have been on the edge of your seat. For most Marxists at the time signed up to what's sometimes called the stage theory of history, which argued that human society had developed and would develop through a series of stages. Feudalism had given way to something called mercantilism, which had given way to capitalism, which would, in turn, give way to communism. It was considered inevitable that capitalism would sow the seeds of its own destruction, and that, as soon as its exploitative nature became clear to the working class, they would rise up to overthrow it. And many felt that the conditions in Germany in 1918 were ripe for such a revolution. Indeed, in Russia, the year prior, exactly that had happened. The February and October revolutions had led to the overthrowing of the Tsar and the establishment of Soviet rule in its place. There was thus a sense among left-wing academics that all they had to do was sit back and wait for Germany, the birthplace of Karl Marx himself, to do the same. And Germany did experience a revolution. Days before the end of the First World War, a sailor's revolt led to uprisings in cities across the country. Ultimately, however, the communist faction of the revolution, led by Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, were outmaneuvered by the less radical Social Democratic Party. While the revolution did lead to the abdication of the Kaiser and the introduction of a new constitution then, 
After the dust had settled, Germany remained a fundamentally capitalist nation. It was with this supposed failure of the German people to throw off the yoke of capitalism in mind that, in May 1923, Felix Weil, the son of a wealthy grain merchant with a keen interest in Marxism, organised the Erste Marxistische Arbeitswoche or First Marxist Work Week. One of the key goals of the week was to consider why it was that Germany's revolution had not yielded greater economic reform. Certainly, the perfidiousness of the Social Democratic Party had played a role, but on being cheated in this way, why didn't the people, who had risen up in great number in support of a socialist revolution, rise up again? The initial plan was for this to be the first in a number of similar conferences for left-wing German intellectuals. Those gathered, however, felt that something more permanent was needed. Felix Weil thus turned to his wealthy father, Hermann, and convinced him to provide an endowment to establish and maintain a permanent institute for Marxist-informed study. On the 22nd of June 1924, then, the Institute for Social Research opened its doors in Frankfurt and Maine. Located at 17 Victoria Alley, Weil appointed as the Institute's first director, Karl Grunberg, an economic and social historian. In his opening address at the Institute, Grunberg described himself as a proponent of scientific socialism, stressing that, when I speak here of Marxism, I do not understand it in terms of party politics, but rather in a purely scientific sense, that is, as an integral system of economics, of a scientific worldview and a clearly circumscribed method of research. What is clear from this is that Grunberg did not see the role of the Institute as being to write a new version of the Communist Manifesto, but to instead engage in a more detached form of study, informed by the theoretical, economic approach of Marx's capital. Although initially seeing the failure of the German Revolution as a wake-up call to reconsider their analysis of society, however, the work produced by the Institute during this period was pretty similar to that which had gone on before. Studies published by scholars working at the Institute for Social Research during its first few years boasted such tantalising titles as Economy and Society in China, The Law of Accumulation and Collapse in the Capitalist System, and Experiments in Economic Planning in the Soviet Union 1917-1927. Throughout, the stage theory of history remained very much intact. Rather than questioning the notion that a socialist revolution was inevitable, the Institute seemed merely to have come to the conclusion that the time hadn't quite been right. All of this was to change in 1930, however, when Grunberg fell ill and resigned his post as director. The position was soon filled by Max Horkheimer, who was not an economist nor a historian, but instead had trained in psychology and philosophy. This evidently gave Horkheimer a somewhat different perspective on society, and his tenure as director saw the introduction of a new set of theoretical influences to the Institute. In particular, it led to a shift away from economics and an embrace of the social sciences instead. Or, in other words, it led to a shift away from the study of the economy and towards the study of people, society and culture. See, Horkheimer was highly sceptical of the notion that capitalism would inevitably lead to a socialist revolution. He saw the kind of empirical study which Grunberg had encouraged at the Institute to be somewhat naive. Such an approach, he argued, assumed that people engage with the economy and society more broadly entirely logically. It assumed that, as soon as people recognised that they were being exploited, they would instantly cast off the system that was exploiting them. Horkheimer, however, recognised that the reality was somewhat more complex. Three years earlier, for instance, he'd written an essay titled The Impotence of the German Working Class, which argued that capitalism, rather than inspiring insurrection, had fairly successfully integrated the working class into its structure. In particular, he noted that a wedge had successfully been driven between those who were in long-term employment and those who were more sporadically or entirely unemployed, which led to the former group often voting and acting to sustain capitalism and thus protect their jobs rather than risk them in the turmoil of either violent or democratic revolution. Horkheimer's approach, and that of the other scholars who he brought to work at the Institute, such as Theodore Adorno, Eric Fromm and Herbert Marcuse, was thus far more holistic. 
It encompassed the study of social and cultural forces as well as simply economic ones. And rather than theorising the manner in which the working class would overthrow capitalism, it primarily sought to shed light on the various ways in which they were discouraged from doing so. In a 1936 paper, Horkheimer would christen this mode of societal analysis critical theory. The goal of critical theory was, and is, to draw upon diverse fields from economics to sociology to political science to psychology and geography, say, to foreground the ways in which capitalism encourages conformity. As Stephen Eric Bronner has written then, the Frankfurt School were concerned less with what Marx called the economic base than the political and cultural superstructure of society. They recognised that understanding how capitalism works required more than just an understanding of its economic aspects, but also how it shapes social and cultural forces too, and in turn, how society and culture shape us. It is perhaps already evident that Horkheimer and Co's view of the world was somewhat bleak. The optimism of the early Institute for Social Research had been replaced with a view of the world, or at least Germany, that saw the overthrow of capitalism as becoming increasingly unlikely. Yet, in 1933, matters became even worse when Adolf Hitler was made Chancellor of Germany. As left-wing intellectuals, those working at and associated with the Frankfurt School would have already been under threat. On top of this, however, the majority of its number were also Jewish. With the swastika flag raised over Frankfurt Town Hall then, Horkheimer made the decision to close the institute premises on Victoria Ali and to lead the Frankfurt School into exile. It would be 16 years before the Frankfurt School would return to Germany. Yet, in spite of the circumstances, the years in exile were highly productive. The Institute first moved to Geneva, before, in 1935, Eric Fromm, on a visit to the United States, persuaded Columbia University in New York to provide the group with a new home. The Frankfurt School set up base at 428 West 117th Street in Morningside Heights, but in truth, they spent little time in New York. In 1940, Horkheimer moved to California, with Theodore Adorno following not far behind. Herbert Marcuse instead moved to Washington, where he worked for the Office of Strategic Services, the forerunner to the CIA. Both the rise of fascism in Europe and the slide of the USSR into authoritarianism would have a huge impact on the work of the Frankfurt School. Far from simply studying why people might fail to embrace socialism, an ideology which many of the Frankfurt School thinkers had an increasingly testing relationship with, the school's work now also had to take into account why people had come to embrace various forms of totalitarianism. This is the central concern of one of the Frankfurt School's key texts, a book written collaboratively by Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno called Dialectic of Enlightenment. In Dialectic of Enlightenment, Horkheimer and Adorno locate the origin of the rise of totalitarianism in the Enlightenment. And this at first might seem strange. The Enlightenment, an intellectual movement which took place mostly during the 18th century, argued for the supremacy of human reason above all else. And what could be less reasonable than fascism? Well, Horkheimer and Adorno did not see totalitarianism as irrational. Instead, they saw it as reason and rationality taken to its ultimate extreme. See, Enlightenment thinking sought to understand the world empirically. It sought to do away with mysticism and mere belief in favour of quantification and the discovery of universal laws which explained how the world works. And this is all well and good when applied to physics and chemistry, yet when we apply this same way of thinking to people, it has a somewhat darker potential. Horkheimer and Adorno saw totalitarianism as the application of an extreme conception of objectivism, uniformity and standardisation to the whole of society, with the consequence of the reduction of individuals to mere numbers, solely parts of a machine. Horkheimer and Adorno did not only see these traits as being present in Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia, however. They argued that the same kind of thinking had also come to permeate the capitalist nations. 
Perhaps inspired by their surroundings in Los Angeles, they wrote acerbically of what they called the culture industry. They wrote that culture today is infecting everything with sameness. Film, radio, and magazines form a system. Each branch of culture is unanimous with itself, and all are unanimous together. Horkheimer and Adorno argued that the sole goal of the culture industry was to make money, and thus that it had come to rely on creating films, music, books, and whatever else which pleased as many people as possible as much of the time as possible. And through creating a culture permeated by sameness, they argued that what they referred to as mass culture robbed people of their imagination and their potential for individuality. Dialectic of Enlightenment is a somewhat dense philosophical text. Earlier, however, I stated the Frankfurt School's desire to combine methods from multiple academic disciplines in their studies. Later then, Adorno, along with a number of other scholars at the University of California, Berkeley, set about studying authoritarianism from a more clearly sociological and psychological standpoint. The results of their studies were published in a 1950 book called The Authoritarian Personality, which most famously derived an F scale, which sought to identify how liable an individual might be to supporting a fascist political program. Through asking a set of questions to an individual, it claimed to be able to place them on a spectrum from democratic personality to authoritarian personality. Though its findings would later come to be challenged, the authoritarian personality came to be highly influential. It is interesting to note here, however, the use of the term democratic in Adorno et al's spectrum. For the research carried out at Berkeley was heavily informed by similar research that the Frankfurt School had undertaken before leaving Germany. In those earlier studies, the spectrum had referred to an authoritarian personality and a revolutionary personality. It was not as if much had been changed about the definition of the latter personality either. The term revolutionary had merely been swapped out for democratic. There are a number of ways of reading this change. Firstly, the Frankfurt School had never been afraid of altering their language for reasons of political expediency. They had often avoided using recognisably Marxist terminology in describing their work in order not to put off less radically minded readers, funders or other stakeholders. Many on the left, however, increasingly began to wonder whether the Frankfurt School had lost its radical edge. A year before the publication of The Authoritarian Personality in 1950, with the Second World War having ended in the defeat and dissolution of Nazi Germany, Horkheimer made the decision to move the Frankfurt School back to its original home, now part of the newly established Federal Republic of Germany, or colloquially, West Germany. The Frankfurt School now found themselves at the forefront of German sociological thinking. The critical theory that Horkheimer had envisaged in 1936 and developed along with Adorno in Dialectic of Enlightenment was now an established body of work, which had begun to have a real influence on how scholars in multiple fields approached the study of human society, politics and culture. The following years saw the publication of a number of further works by Frankfurt School scholars. In 1951, Theodore Adorno published Minima Moralia, Reflections from a Damaged Life, which argued that human life was now irrevocably damaged, and that, however hard one tried, the inhumanity of contemporary society made living a good, honest life, as centuries of philosophers had sought to define it, was now impossible. In 1964, Herbert Marcuse published a book called One Dimensional Man, Studies in the Ideology of Advanced Industrial Society, which came to some not dissimilar conclusions. A critique of both capitalist society and that of the Soviet Union, the book argued that, under both systems, critical thinking was becoming a dying art. In the capitalist nations, Marcuse argued, people have become so assimilated into the capitalist mode of production and the bureaucracy needed to maintain it that they fail to be able to think in anything but a one-dimensional manner, uncritical of the system around them. 
The pessimism which had begun with Horkheimer's declaration of the impotence of the German working class and been exacerbated by the Frankfurt School's wartime experience had thus seemingly come to permeate its work. The only voice resistant to this pessimism within the Frankfurt School was that of Jürgen Habermas, who had joined the school to study under Horkheimer and Adorno in 1956, but who increasingly was at odds with his mentors. Though he would later return to become the director of the Institute for Social Research, he in fact transferred his PhD away from it to the University of Marburg in order to escape what he saw as the Frankfurt School's unbearable defeatism. The divisions within the Frankfurt School over whether any hope remained for socialist revolution would come to a head in May 1968, when, as I've discussed in my video on Guy Debord's Society of the Spectacle, civil unrest broke out in France. Students and workers took to the streets in a defiantly anti-capitalist uprising. It's worth stressing that these protests had a huge impact. France's economy was brought to a complete standstill. The president, Charles de Gaulle, was evacuated to Germany, and the government genuinely feared the outbreak of full-scale revolution. Though less pronounced than in France, students in other nations also went out onto the streets in support of various causes. What united all of them was an opposition to the authoritarian form of capitalism which had come to dominate the advanced capitalist nations. Indeed, their critique of contemporary society shared much with that of Horkheimer and Adorno in Dialectic of Enlightenment. Nevertheless, it was Herbert Marcuse who had the clearest influence on the striking students of May 1968. His essay, Repressive Tolerance, published in 1965, had ably foregrounded the manner in which capitalist society could feature totalitarian aspects, and this spoke fairly directly to the protesters' grievances. More than this, however, where Horkheimer and Adorno remained sceptical of the likelihood that any meaningful change would come out of the so-called eventement, Marcuse was quite glad that some of his more pessimistic pronouncements in One Dimensional Man seemed to have been proven wrong, and that critical thinking and action were alive and well. Horkheimer and Adorno's refusal to find any hope in the strikes and protests did not go unnoticed either. Activists began to disrupt Adorno's lectures, with the one-time Marxist shift in ideological position perhaps being exemplified by his decision to call the police. This only made matters worse, and later, a group of students invaded his lecture theatre once again, writing on the blackboard, if Adorno is left in peace, Capitalism will never cease. Adorno was eventually forced to cancel the rest of his lectures, which were to be some of his last before his death in 1969. Horkheimer too died just a few years later in 1973, with Marcuse passing away in 1978. In 1983, Jürgen Habermas became director of the Institute for Social Research, and his own work has been almost as influential of that as his forebears. Given his early work in which he introduced the concept of the public sphere to the world, it is no surprise that he has been a truly public intellectual. Perhaps most notable, given the fact that many of the Frankfurt School conspiracy theories revolve around some form of plot to undermine Western values, in 2004, Habermas took part in a debate with Pope Benedict XVI at the Catholic Academy of Bavaria, in which he argued for the positive role that religion can play in holding society together. Though I would very much like to discuss the work of Habermas in a future video, however, it is very much the period between Horkheimer's installation as director of the Institute of Social Research and his and Adorno's death that most people are referring to when they speak of the Frankfurt School. As such, I'll take the opportunity to draw this video to a bit of a close. The impact that the Frankfurt School had upon how we critically analyse the world around us is undeniable. With regard to left-wing thought in the broadly Marxist tradition, they were a key factor in discouraging a purely economic analysis, which saw capitalism's collapse as inevitable, and the development of a more holistic study of capitalism, cognizant of the influence of social and cultural forces in its maintenance. 
Egypts. Though the school may have had radical origins, however, in truth this revolutionary zeal faded over time. Towards the ends of their lives, many of its most prominent members were more likely to be chided for their deeply ingrained pessimism than they were to be held up as examples of dangerous insurgents. Indeed, far from presenting us with a unified doctrine of thought, the work of the Frankfurt School is highly diverse, both in the aspects of society that it focuses on and the methods that it uses in its analysis. It is partly this diversity and embrace of ideas from an array of different academic subjects that has allowed it to have such a wide-ranging influence across fields, including sociology, philosophy, political science, and many more. If we were to pick out one key theme from the work of the Frankfurt School, however, it would be the potential that contemporary society has to foster conformity and to erode individuality. The critical theory that Horkheimer, Adorno, Marcuse and others developed asks us to be watchful for these tendencies and work to find ways of engaging with the world which enable individuality and empathy to flourish. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you have a friend who you think might be interested in the life and ideas of the Frankfurt School, uh, then please do uh, send it on to them. That would be great. Uh, thank you, as always, to Ash, to Jay Fraser Cartwright, to Michael V. Brown, to Army of Me, and to Sindri Nielsen, all for being signed up to the top tier uh, of my Patreon. If you would like to join them in supporting what I do here, then uh, you can check out how to do so and all the perks and stuff at patreon.com forward slash Tom Nicholas. With that out of the way, however, thanks so much much for watching once again and have a great week.